the basal ganglia. So this is neuroanatomy rather than neuroscience. If you're a long time viewer, you know how good I am at neuroanatomy or neuroscience. Eh. Anyway, um, I'm at home because I'm not allowed to go to work. I'm not allowed out very much because we're trying to limit the spread of the COVID-19 virus across Britain. So those of you in the future who are wondering what it was like, this is what it was like. Um, and uh, neuroanatomy then is kind of a good topic if I'm not allowed in the labs because I haven't got that many resources that I can point to on the brain to show you where these bits are. So the basal ganglia, you can discuss and describe and examine this at a range of different levels, can't you? So we're going to start off with me describing the basal ganglia whenever it comes up in polite conversation, whenever I need to introduce it. So we're thinking of the level of, of what do first and second year medical students need to know about the basal ganglia. From there, you can jump off to look at the interconnections and the neuroscience in more detail, right? But that's for neuroscientists, that's for somebody else, not for me. Okay, so how do I describe the basal ganglia when it first comes up as a new concept for somebody? Right, okay, so whenever you make a movement, like this seems like a really simple thing to do, doesn't it? Making a movement is a simple thing, and yet it's not a simple thing. Watch when I do this. So if I point my finger, I'm not just contracting muscles to extend the finger. There's a whole lot more going on. To, if some muscles are going to get shorter for a movement to occur, that means the opposite muscles, the antagonistic muscles, other muscles, have got to relax and get longer. Otherwise that movement won't happen. But it's more than just that. Look how my balance changes, right? My centre of gravity has shifted, which means there must be a lot of uh, information going into my brain, proprioceptive, postural stuff, that my brain has got to process and then contract other muscles to change my posture so I don't fall over. That's the basal ganglia. You think about making a movement, that's the easy bit. The basal ganglia essentially makes a lot of connections and inhibitions and excitatory things that then makes that simple idea into an action. So what happens when it doesn't work? We need to go back to the word ganglion, don't we? Basal ganglia. Um, if you read about basal nuclei, it's the same thing. Basal nuclei is the correct term, the contemporary term. Um, the basal ganglia were first discovered many decades ago, I think probably more than a century ago. And as our understanding has changed, our naming has changed, not of just of the basal ganglia, the basal nuclei as a whole, but the other bits and bobs, as we'll see. Um, a ganglion is a collection of nerve cell bodies. A nucleus is a collection of nerve cell bodies, and then the axons run out from those things. So essentially they're the same thing, but we use them in different places, don't we? A ganglion is a collection of nerve cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, a nucleus is a collection of nerve cell bodies in the central nervous system, which means that the basal ganglia, if they're collections of nerve cell bodies, which they are, and lots of connections with other bits, they should correctly be called the basal nuclei. Basal, basal, basal. They're a kind of towards the base of the <laughs> forebrain. Eh. I would list the basal ganglia, so the basal ganglia, it's a collection of ganglia, or the basal nuclei, as chordate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus, um, substantia nigra, the ones, those are the ones I always always remember, and then the nucleus accumbens is the bit I don't remember. Ooh, and the subthalamic nucleus. We can see the thalamus, we can see the hypothalamus, so the subthalamic nucleus, a little diddy nucleus, inferior to the, the thalamus. That's my list, that's the same as the list in my favourite textbook, um, but you will read of other structures, so beware. But also these things get grouped together. You'll read about the uh, striatum. They're like gouges, stripes, that's how they were first seen. Uh, grooves, really. And you will read about their lenticular nucleus or the lentiform nucleus, kind of meaning lens shape. Now the putamen and the globus pallidus are together and you can see them on this image of a section of one of the models. Um, it's it's kind of lens shape, right? It's like a wedge, lentiform 
lenticular nucleus. That's the same as the putamen and the globus pallidus, or rather they are two parts of it. Right, there are, there's a dorsal striatum and a ventral striatum. The uh, ventral striatum, ventral, dorsal, is made up of the nucleus accumbens and the olfactory tubercle. Kind of little ditty nuclei, don't ask me to try and point to them, because I don't think I could. Um, they're kind of a bit lateral to the midline, kind of in the anyway. And if those are the ventral striatum, then the dorsal striatum are made up of the putamen and the chordate nucleus. Now you can see the chordate nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus fairly easily. The striatum then, the ventral striatum, the dorsal striatum link a couple of bits. The chordate nucleus has got, it's kind of got a little bit of a tail that runs posteriorly, almost looks a bit like the hippocampus, which again is going to be really difficult to see on a transverse section, but you will see the main body of it. Okay, so you tell me. If parts of the basal ganglia get injured, what's going to happen? Well, most notably, there are going to be problems with initiating movements, with controlling movements and that sort of thing, right? So you'd expect to see tremors. Um, you'd expect to see kind of uh, slower movements, make it harder to initiate movements, harder to control movements, changing posture that could change the shape of the body and that sort of thing, right? all those things that we expect the basal ganglia to do and if, of course if different parts of it are damaged then we're going to see we're going to see different things best example of this or maybe the worst example is our parkinson's and huntington's disease or huntington's career all right parkinson's parkinson's does give a really good indication of how all this works parkinson's disease um, in patients with parkinson's disease we see a reduction in the number of neurons in the um, substantia nigra. Now that's in the in the midbrain. So the substantia nigra, if you cut a section through the midbrain of a of a fresh brain, you will see a dark patch, substantia nigra, dark substance. The reason it's dark is because these cells are making uh, neuromelanin, uh, just like the melanin that puts pigment in your skin, which. I'm not getting a lot of because I'm not getting a, time out, a lot of time outside. Anyway, but they also make dopamine and they extend their neurons up to the other parts of the basal ganglia and they send the dopamine up to the basal ganglia and dopamine is a neurotransmitter. With a loss of cells of the substantia nigra, there's a reduction in the amount of dopamine being produced for the basal ganglia. I said that the basal ganglia is all about connections. If these connections can't be made, the basal ganglia can't work properly. So a loss of the cells of the substantia nigra causes loss of function in the basal ganglia. So we see those tremors and tone changes. We also see other things. We see uh, sometimes a loss of smell. Sometimes we see... Um, changes in, in mood, we see um, changes in sleep patterns and that sort of thing which are also indicating that the basal ganglia is heavily involved and heavily tied into many other systems of the brain that we take for granted. Huntington's disease or Huntington's career is um, it's a loss of neurons, right? So there are, there are neurons that are lost in the brain, they're lost in the basal ganglia and then most notably lost in the chordate nucleus. It tends to occur later in life, it's hereditary, so some people see this as particularly cruel because it, it doesn't show itself until after somebody has had a family, which means they probably passed on the disease to their children. Um, and um, just like other injuries to the basal ganglia, um, there are changes in, in movement. So um, there's an increase in the number of involuntary movements. There are more involuntary movements. But also as the disease progresses, it tends to, um, you tend to see changes in, I think, mood, but in personality, in cognitive function. There's cognitive decline, which often leads to dementia, which is the sort of thing you see with neuronal cell loss, right? As is often the case with these neurological conditions, they give us uh, an insight into into how the brain works and and what happens when it all goes wrong and they do tell us a lot about the basal ganglia 
Um, but there's also a lot more complexity to this. Uh, one of the reasons neuroscience is so difficult to study and neuroanatomy is because not all of the links and connections are understood. We don't understand the functions of all of these parts of the brain. So I think if you have this basic idea of the basal ganglia as a collection of nuclei, these basal nuclei with connections to the brain which are involved in initiating movements and organising those simple ideas that we have into the complex movements that we take for granted but also having other connections the limbic systems involved for example so there are the association with emotion here then you can work out what happens when the basal ganglia or parts of the basal ganglia are damaged and you can recognize parts of the basal ganglia right was that any use if you recognize the words the terms when you go and read your favourite neuroscience textbook, hopefully it'll be easier to digest and absorb. And that's how neuroanatomy and neuroscience link. I do the lumpy bumpy bits, Phil Newton does the magic beyond that bit. I think that's about the level that first and second year medical students should be able to talk about the basal ganglia about at, about. Um, and recognising those parts, and if you can recognise those parts on, on uh, transverse MR, then um, that's helpful too. <sighs> right, um, okay, I did a video, <laughs> see you guys next week, maybe.